Yeah, it's October 31st today, and it's Halloween, and the most, uh, well, the thing that I'm most afraid of right now is the test tomorrow, aka the midterms. So, you guys won't be seeing me for, like, a week. So, brace yourselves. Hey guys, what's up? And today, I'm gonna do a review on the latest Tool album, 10,000 days, and by latest I mean it's 12 and a half years ago since this album had dropped, and I was 3 years old when this album dropped, and now I'm 16. Yep. Anyway, let's not give the band too much pressure to release their next album. Anyway, Tool is an LA math rock doom metal band that's unlike any other bands ever because they tend to go against the mainstream. Hardcore. It consists of the eccentric troll and vocalist Maynard James Keenan, legendary drummer Danny Carey, guitarist Adam Jones, and bassist Justin Chancellor, who recorded songs like Dilemma and Black Paint with Death Grips this year. I think I I, I actually I'm actually not sure if he did those tracks or not. But anyway, Ten Thousand Days is their fourth studio album after Undertow. Anima, and Lateralis. And each of these albums are packed with these long-winded, dystopian, and multifaceted metal epics sandwiched by weird, noisy interludes, and usually they sound like a mix between a religious hymn or some aggressive punk prog rock. And their lyrics are really philosophical as well. Usually they're about existence, humanity, consciousness, and hookers with penises. Maynard's smooth, slightly raspy but high voice is great and memorable, the guitars are sound crispy as hell, and the drums are magnificent. Danny Carey is truly irreplaceable. Even though this album is 75 minutes long and has 11 tracks, it really only has 6 core tracks, Vicarious, Jambi, the title track, The Pot, Rosetta Stoned, and Right in Two. The album starts off with Vicarious, at first with some steadily ticking guitar riffs which sound awesome. I was hooked by the riff the first time I listened to the track, and then it hits a drop where it becomes an aggressive guitar jam in 10-8 or 5-4 or 10-4 time signature, I can't tell, but anyway, the bass riff is fucking good. The lyrics of this track is about how we humans secretly love to see people and things die. And yes, the reason why I didn't like this track all that much at first is because the lyrics are way edgier than the ones on Lateralis. But now I like the lyrics. Vicariously, I want to watch things die. Since their tracks don't really have a structure, really, so a beat switch or an instrumental switch Switch, switch, switch can happen anytime. And on Vicarious, we get a part where it's just synchronized rough guitar licks and drum bangs as Maynard goes, why can't we just admit it? And that's really, really cool. And the super speed ascending guitars and the drums at the end is such an epic and transcending end to the track. And overall, this track is just such a monster, but the lyrics are really sinister and smart and it had grown on me so much so that it might be my favorite track off of the album. And right next, it's Jambi with some quick paced guitar riffs and ruffling drums. Sounds like horse riding. The lyrics are mainly about making wishes and therefore the title Jambi, who is apparently a genie in a cartoon Maynard watched. The verses are good, the chorus is solid, and it's a great track overall. The lyrics are really poetic too, Maynard's a real poet. The third and fourth track are also Wings for Marie, parts 1 and 2, except the fourth track is also the title track. We get these very cold, dystopian, and dark guitars that are constantly running and running, and these very deep and ominous percussions, like gongs or something, it's 
really creepy. And Maynard comes in with a very faint and muzzled voice that's almost completely buried into the instrumentals. And these two tracks are dedicated to Maynard's mother, Judith Marie, and they both share the same tone, rhythm, and chords. And then we hit the title track, which is truly a remarkable and breathtaking track. It's titled 10,000 Days because it's roughly 10,000 days since Maynard's mother experienced a brain aneurysm which had left her paralyzed until she passed away. And therefore, thus the line, 10,000 days in the fire is long enough, I'm coming home. The melodies of the vocals are so dark, ominous, and chilling, it gives me goosebumps. And it gets more and more intense as it builds up to a huge climax that's really explosive and destructive. I still remember listening to this song last year on my way to school. On the night before, this classmate of mine, this suicidal girl, told her boyfriend that she found a solution. We all thought she may give in to the voices in her head and kill herself. So I and my friend, we decided to go to school early to check if she would return to school or not, to check if she's alive or not. And this song really got me super worried and super anxious. I was literally shaking when I was listening to the song. Fetch me the spirit, the song. And by the way, she's alive now. She's alive and happy. But to light things up a little bit, we get the fifth track, The Pot, which is a total metal banger. This song is a more straightforward and relatively shorter track about hypocrisy. Who are you to wave your finger? You must have been out of your head. You must have been high. The guitar riff of this thing is badass, someone slammed the door. Maynard's vocals are clearer than ever, I like how the production and the sound quality of the album is way better, and Maynard's vocals are way less muffled and buried in the background. And once again, the lyrics are really well written. Some of my favorite lines are liar, lawyer, mirror, show me, what's the difference? Now you're weeping shades of Kazend Indigo, got lemon juice up in your eye. And also that one line about head up asshole, <laughs> that one's pretty funny. And then at the end we got these very sharp strikes of ascending guitars and drums that are, that are such blasts of energy. It's really amazing. And for a transitional track we get Lipan or Lipan Conjuring, which is basically a minute of some kind of tribal player and it's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting interlude. Then we have Lost Keys, Blame Hoffman, and Rosetta Stone. The former track leads up to the latter. The former track is more of a spoken word dialogue piece where we get a conversation between a doctor and a nurse, talking about a patient who's not speaking and they don't know what the hell's wrong with him. And then we get Rosetta Stone, truly one of the most legendary metal tracks of the 2000s because it's just so epic, so ambitious, so gargantuan, and the story behind is so intriguing and innovative. Why do I taste blood once again? Yeah, there's no... Why? Why do I taste blood? Yeah, anyway, it has yet another killer bass riff and some really muddy, messy vocal sound effects at the beginning of the track. Maynard's voice is so low and raspy at first, and he's talking about all sorts of weird things in such a high speed. It's like he's making noises like... And I love that. Then we get the verses which are more bright and adventurous, Maynard sings in his normal voice again and it's great, the hook is really stiff and rigid, 
strapped down to my bed, feet cold and eyes red. I'm out of my head, am I alive, am I dead? Can't remember what they said, god damn, shit the bed. And the chorus sounds really sane, but at the same time, it's really catchy and wondrous with a steady 8-8 time signature, which is pretty rare, and therefore the punchy bass and drums. At the middle part of the track, we get Maynard singing in a very nasal vocal that are very muffled and filtered. filtered. And it sounds like he's drunk because his voice cracks a lot and it's intentional and it's cool. Towards the ending of the track, we get these very exciting and intense guitars and drums jamming together. Then all of a sudden, just before we think it's going to end, it breaks into this very stripped back section where the guitars are more minimal but the drums go completely nuts. Danny Carey really killed it with all eight of his arms. And then it hits the great climax, which gives me goosebumps, and it just gives me such a sense of awe. And the track ended with these stiff and sharp strikes of vocals, guitars, and drums very precisely. And it's such a dramatic and theatrical way to end off the track. And, uh, and following it, we get Intention, which is a very interesting track. It's one of the more trippy and disorienting and airy and spacey tool tracks. We get this very subtle ambient backdrop with a tool twist and Maynard's vocals Buried in the track, in the back, in the back of the track. Ha <laughs> ha! Very softly, with vocal harmonies, and it's sort of floating around here and there like a ghost for around seven minutes. And yes, this track is rather disjointed and kind of disorganized, even though I love the vibe that it gives off. It's so ancient, it sounds almost religious. But it really leads up to the final tr core track. Right in two, which is a way sturdier and clearer track with a golden chord progression. As well as some really poetic lyrics about angels getting confused and baffled as God, the creator, gave humans free will. Maynard even described humans as monkeys killing each other, monkeys fighting over land, and giving humans free will will only make us destroy each other because of our stupidity. I love the concept of this track, but I wish a solution would be given, like, oh, that's why humans are given free will. But anyway, it's a great track and a solid and powerful way to end off the album. But just before the album actually ends, we get Viginti Trez, which is five minutes of weird ambient drone noises that really creep me out every time I listen to it. They're very ghoulish and haunted and grim. It's like lost souls and ashes and the wind and you can also hear words being said but being stretched out for so long it becomes pure noise and there's also this faint choir sound which i think it's not actually a choir singing it's something else but actually if you play this track and then wings from a re part one while you play the title track you can craft yourself a complete 10,000 days mega mix experience thing and I think that's pretty cool it adds so much more texture and uncertainty to the title track and overall despite not releasing an album for five years Tool still got it the vocals are way up front the guitars are killer as always the drums are breathtaking and the production and the sound quality is improved by leagues even though there's only six core tracks here all six ugh, all six of them are good at least, and four of them are simply really great. And as always, Tool always gives this strangely religious and tribal vibe that makes their music sound ancient. Sounds like something that we would hear if we live in the year 500 or 600 BC, but it's 
metal, so it's more menacing and teeth gritting. The album cover is cool as fuck. I'm not a huge fan of clustered eyeballs because of that one dream I had when I was six, but the album cover is like some sort of temple that exists in a higher level of consciousness and dimension that reaches infinity and it brings us to realization or something. It's nuts, and I love it. My least favorite track is Intention, sorry if it's your favorite, and my favorite is Vicarious, even though it's probably a tie with Rosetta Stone. I'm giving Tools 10,000 days a 9 out of 10. So, have you listened to the very, very good Tool album, 10,000 Days, from 1 to 1,000, or, or 10,000? How much would you rate it? Like if you like it. And subscribe. If you want more. And I don't know why, but I just feel like showing off my Coca-Cola lollipop and my grape one because I'm going to have to eat one of them tonight before it turns bad or something. I don't know.